Welcome to the Free Marketeers, the official podcast of the Free Market Foundation. Hello, listeners. Uh, welcome to another episode of the Free Marketeers with me, Martin van Staden. As always, I am joined by Chris Hutton and Piaki Dlamini. We're all uh, researchers here at the Free Market Foundation. What do you mean as always? Last week you left us alone, so... <laughs> hey, I, I had some actual work to do. These, oh, wow. these podcasts, I, I enjoy them too much to qualify them as, as work, so uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. But anyway, yeah, so I thought um, we don't really discuss... Uh, international trade trade between countries a lot on uh, on the free marketeers even though the free market foundation obviously has a long history of being in favor of free trade and um, with the especially uh, america and donald trump and the tariffs against especially china in the news lately a lot i know um today it was announced that uh, some tariffs on Turkish goods were actually lowered in the U.S. I just thought that uh, the three of us would discuss um, trade generally and uh, where we stand on it. I mean, it's obviously a foregone conclusion. We believe in uh, free trade, basically just free markets, the same that we want in South Africa. We want that to uh, apply across borders as well. Uh, government should basically, in all respects, stay out of it. Uh, maybe check that you no know, nuclear bombs are being brought ac across the borders. But uh, other than that, let it through. Uh, let companies, let individuals trade. Um, I'm looking especially at you, Reserve Bank, for uh, for levying customs on literal money that we uh, <laughs> uh, pass across the borders with your foreign exchange control is uh, ridiculous. So yeah, I thought uh, we'd start with you and Piaki. Um, free trade, I mean, uh, people even free marketeers, which I find interesting, you uh, often come with this argument and say, yes, no free trade, but look, they subsidize their industries and it would be so unfair for our local industries if we did not subsidize them, but they're forced to compete with foreign industries that are being subsidized. That's why we need these <laughs> measures. What do you think about that? Opinion? Well, it's, uh, this is, this is, a, this is the problem that you, if you, where you, that you get, if you are a collectivist, you don't, one of the, one of the symptoms is that you don't think properly. So the, the problem, the problem, the problem there with this subsidization argument is so that free market years just got real. So <laughs> imagine, for example, let's say uh, you, let's say we're trading with uh, Zimbabwe, the South Africa, and Zimbabwe is producing tobacco. So Zimbabwe decides to subsidize their, to, uh, their tobacco industry. Mm. So they can sell tobacco in South Africa for much uh, more cheaply than any South African farm can. So who's who, who's losing there? It means mm -hmm. that South African consumers mm -hmm. are getting tobacco cheaply at the expense of Zimbabwean taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Who would complain about that? The farmers in South Africa, I assume. Well, the farmers in South Africa can start other business because there's so much. Because we will have, uh, we will presumably have so much uh, excess. We will have uh, excess money because we we just got this cheap, mm. cheap tobacco mm, courtesy of the Zimbabwean government. Mm. So you can like we can buy. The farmers might suffer, but someone else who starts a business let's say uh, someone who decides to start a restaurant or something will spend what the, the disposable income that mm. we have now all of a sudden because of this chook tobacco mm. yeah i don't think the farmers will have to worry because with expropriation without compensation south african farmers won't have anything so they can do yeah, other exactly. jobs so it's okay <laughs> exactly but so just on the final point i need to make is that uh, yeah free trade is always a good idea that's why in in africa right now there are moves to have free trade with, among african countries what what does worry me is this idea of a common external tariff like the EU has, no. but otherwise, like it seems to be it seems to be seems to be we are, South Africa is seem to be moving in there mm. in Africa at least it seems to be moving there to the right area in terms of free trade. No. Yeah. And Chris, uh, so with this thing about protecting local industries to ensure that they can compete with foreign subsidized industries, I think embedded in this is this this notion that if you start a company you basically must be guaranteed to succeed. Mm. Uh, you must be protected mm. against failure. You're, you're more philosophically inclined. Tell us about the, uh, the premises at play here and, and what the problems or whether there are problems at all here um, uh, are. So what do you think? I think that sort of view assumes that you're entitled to a job. Mm. So no matter what you do, that's going to be your job for the rest of your life. It's almost a feudal perspective on mm. things. You've got this thing and you're secure no matter what you do, whether you actually produce a good product or service or not. Mm. And that you know, is obviously fundamentally a problem because none of us are entitled to our jobs. We have to perform yeah. mm. day after day, month after month kind of thing, no matter what we do. Uh, I think the, the matter of, of thinking we need to protect our own mm. sort of thing, as Mpiaki pointed out, is that collectivist way of thinking. 
when I buy a product, I'm trading with that company that made it, whether they're yeah. here or in America yeah. or China or wherever. It's not South Africa trading on my behalf. Yeah. Uh, that's also, the, I think, the wrong way of thinking about it. I'm choosing for myself what to do with my money. I can invest it. I can trade it for a laptop or whatever I'm buying now. And then there's also a, a matter of sort of this nationalist interest. Let's take the U.S. as the example. Let's think about the motor industry in Detroit and how Detroit has fallen from where it was. The idea that Ford and GM and all these others are these sort of sacrosanct holy cows that yeah. must stand no matter what and, and have subsidies. You know, people who advocate for tariffs, they can't say, oh, the Chinese are subsidizing their things when America is doing it for many industries there as well. So mm. if, if you're going to be an, it's sort of that idea of being an equal opportunity offender, if yes. you have a problem with subsidies, say it across the board. Mm. And then just sort of, I guess, wrapping it up broadly, you should think of trade as a win-win. Mm. We shouldn't think it's a lose-lose because I'm giving money to someone, I'm doing it to get a product or a service in return. Mm. I'm not giving up anything, you know, to me. That thing that I'm getting back is more important to me than the money. Yes that I'm getting. Um, you're on Brook of the Ayn Rand Institute. He often at his talks, he pulls out his iPhone and he says the iPhone is worth way more to him than the thousand dollars he gives Apple. Yeah. So yes, he's losing, losing in effect the thousand dollars, but he's gaining so much more. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and then, yeah, no, that's a bit, that's because of specialization. Yeah. We wouldn't have the modern products, economies, uh, things around the world, the marvels that we have, including in medicine and healthcare. Mm. If it wasn't for specialization, we can't each, yeah. sit in our homes and our gardens and for example make produce that kind of thing yeah. i for example have a massive trade deficit with pick and pay down the road yeah. i mean you know i give them money and they give me stuff from all over the world it's yeah. it's a wonder mm. it's very sad to think that we we think in in these terms where you know a, a company is not giving us stuff in return mm. just because they're you know a local or a foreign business yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think uh, some of this, and, and I mean, I can't be wrong, it seems like a lot of this is uh, grounded in a very mercantilist way mm, of thinking yeah. from a few yeah. centuries back when all of the world was constantly at war. Yeah. And no. basically, uh, these people told themselves, well, geez, we need to produce our own uh, food, we need to produce have our own factories. We basically, every country basically needs to do a lot of everything for themselves mm. because at, at any point uh, there can be a war and then we can't trade anymore mm. so we need to be self-sufficient and all, the, all these things now that is not the case anymore the post world war ii liberal order has secured pretty much perpetual peace mm. i would say on a global scale it's not it doesn't mean uh, there isn't aren't small regional conflicts but i think the days of every country needing to provide for itself uh in in the uh to to guard against some future war where they'll need to to uh, basically cut off all trade mm. and so forth. I think those days are over. So I think this this mentality that's founded in that mercantilist way of thinking of uh, there's always a winner and there's always a loser mm. in every trade. I think that's that's pretty much outdated. And it's unfortunate that, that the United States, which has always been... Uh, even on a on a cultural level, I guess the the uh, pinnacle of we believe in and just doing these things freely, mm. even though they've always had protectionism. Uh, I think it's quite unfortunate that uh, protectionism is now coming back to the fore and and being seen as a, a free market phenomenon mm. because Donald Trump is by many people seen as a free market president. No. Uh, some have even said he's the most libertarian president <laughs> since Reagan or since Calvin Coolidge, mm. which I place a big question mark on. Um, and I know listeners, I know many of you are going to be very happy to hear us say these things about Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, we're looking forward to your comments. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's quite unfortunate. I, I, I think, I think it's a hiccup. I don't think this is going to uh, continue. I think that if you look at where history seems to have been going, it's we're going towards free trade, like mm. Piaki says. Uh, the uh, what's it called? AFTA uh, is it? Is it AFTA? IFCTA, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Um, that's that's a, a positive step, mostly. Uh, mm. And uh, there has been talk of an African passport and so forth for uh, uh, people to move move more freely as well. Uh, that's been a long time coming, but um, well, hopefully it, it happens soon, sooner rather than later. Uh, so I think that mostly we're heading in the right direction and there are these uh, hiccups that we're currently experiencing but i'm i'm quite keen on 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 free trade just becoming an accepted part of of uh, 
human society so that we don't need to really talk about free no, trade no. as opposed or as uh, distinguished from just a free market generally. Yeah. We keep making this foreign domestic distinction, mm. which I don't think is necessary. Yeah. And, and sorry, I just wanted to say that also uh, free trade is probably the most uh, pro poor thing you can do globally. Yeah. I mean, it, it's 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 a much, much, much like by uh, an expon exponential factors more. A bet, much better than aid, for example. Yeah. Mm. Aid is in many ways regressive to a poor, kind, a poor, poor for, for poor people. But free trade is allows something that is quite unique that you can't really get anywhere else. It allows a poor country to get capital investment where it has from countries where it has been built up over centuries. Like for example, a country like England, which has been building up its capital for hundreds of years, you can get companies that have benefited from this built up capital transferring some of that to poor countries like uh, poorer countries like South Africa investing here building uh, roads, building uh, mm. uh, high-tech data centers or whatever it is that's required. Mm. And then you and then you are able to rapidly, that's why you, that's why you see that countries like um, the UK and the USA, they took f hundreds of years to get the ICANN economies to the size where they are now. Mm. But a country like uh, a poorer country can do that in 20 years, mm. 30 years. Yeah, like South that, Korea. Yeah. Exactly, because of free trade. Mm. Because these countries can take the capital they have accumulated over hundreds of years and invest it in these countries. And that's the brilliance of free trade. So this is why for if you are a poor country, the worst thing you can do is put up any at any trade barriers. Mm. If you are a poor country, the best thing you can do for your people is just open up, uh, open up the markets, open up the trade. And also, the another, another important thing to note is that uh, the free movement of labor is exactly equivalent on a one-to-one -one basis with free trade in goods and other things. There is no there is no deep difference between the free movement of labor and the free movement of goods and services and other things like that. And so it doesn't make sense. <coughs> to say okay we are going to restrict immigration because we are going, trying to save a uh, we are trying to save jobs here at home mm. that's that's a that, that's this uh, same variant is a variant of the argument that says we're going to restrict goods from these other guys to protect local industries here at home it's the same argument it's just that the you the focus is not on these people who have jobs it's on companies and so mm. and vice versa and so like if 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 we want to get ourselves out of poverty we will have both mm. drop all the uh, import restrictions at the border for labor and for goods yeah I also just sorry I'd like to point out I mean I read today that now Walmart is going to raise their prices on certain products as a result of these tariffs yeah. so this is just an important reminder for all of us always when a politician says this is going to benefit you know mm. these tariffs are going to benefit my people for example mm. Americans it's clearly going to have a detrimental effect so yeah. you know it's it's right in front of us <laughs> so someone said that uh, people think that tariffs are, are a way to tax those foreigners over there uh, for, right. which is not the case <laughs> so, no no government has the power to tax foreigners you can only tax your own people no. and that's what with tariffs are you are taxing your own people mm. and you think you're taxing foreigners mm. which is stupid <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, to, talking about uh, taxing people and stupid things that governments do Tomorrow is Saturday, the 18th of May, and it is this year's Tax Freedom Day. Uh, so to those of you who are not familiar with the concept of Tax Freedom Day, that is basically the day when you stop working to pay taxes. So imagine if uh, you had to pay taxes every day of the year, um, uh, every day instead of every uh, year or every three years, then tomorrow would be the day that you have paid what, what you owe SARS and then you start working for yourself. Um, so from tomorrow onwards, you are officially working for your own pocket and no longer for, for government. Uh, you are now a, a free citizen again. Uh, and unfortunately this year, according to the uh, statistician Garvey Zeitzman, who wrote an article in the City Press for today, which we will link below, um, we are working five weeks longer uh, for government than we did in 1994. In 1994, oh. it took us 101 days to pay for uh, government uh, spending, and now it takes us 138 days. So it's uh, been getting worse, unfortunately. Oh. Um, and uh, what Garvey Zitzman also mentions is that South Africa has the 12th highest income tax burden in, in the world, the 9th highest company tax burden in the world and the 77 fires the indirect tax burden in the world. And I think this is out of about 295 countries. So uh, we're not doing terribly well on, on that ranking. Um, Mpiaki, you, you have some ideas or some notes about how Tax Freedom Day is calculated. Uh, can you share that with the listeners? So basically they take the total uh, tax burden that you have to pay 
across or across all government so general government taxation you take all of that and then you you calculate that as a percentage as a percentage of income and then you calculate that all annually and so you say if if the 5th of may makes up let's say 40 percent of the year and then the, it, it shows that the you, you have a 40 percent tax by then mm. and so like it means from january up until may you have been working basically mm. everything you've earned has gone to government mm -hmm. and then that's when everything you end after that particular day which is tomorrow mm. then starts going back to you so that's the the, the basics of it you just it's the, it's the day where you no longer you you do stop being a slave after that <laughs> and then you can start being free but it's uh, of course you can also decide to de make it a proportion of income rather than calculating as a. But that's you know you, you don't complicate it. It's, an, it's mm. a nice mm. simple idea tax freedom mm. day. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So that so that's a good way to determine whether you have a high or a low tax burden in South Africa. You see whether tax freedom day is earlier or later in the year. So mm. the closer we get to the end of December, the more taxes we're paying. If we pay taxes up until the end of December, it means we're literally slaves <laughs> uh, and if we uh, only pay taxes on the 1st of January f on, uh, up until 1 a.m. in the morning then it's basically anarchy there's no government uh, Biaki you'll like that a lot but I'll surprise you asked the anarchist about taxation yes <laughs> yeah so that I think it's it's a pretty good illustration to really and, and it's, it's difficult to tell people yes oh my goodness our tax rate has now gone up to this percentage and people are like yeah okay it's, it's very abstract mm. I think when you say when you can um, explain it to them in, in the format of Tax Freedom Day, mm. it, it becomes a lot simpler. They think, oh my goodness, uh, five months into the year and only now do uh, does the money that I earn actually start counting towards my own development, my own realization of mm. my own destiny, my own uh, affairs, my own interests and goals. Uh, so yeah, I think uh, Tax Freedom Day is a, is a good way to me uh, measure that. And uh, Chris, you... Um, you mentioned to me earlier that uh, our Tax Freedom Day is moving more closer towards December because of a certain another tax that's going to start being levied this year. Uh, explain that to the listeners. Yeah, so from June, we're going to have the carbon tax, uh, and that's going to impose all sorts of other costs on, the, well, not just the car industry, but that'll, of course, be passed further on to consumers. I'm sure part of it is going to be some sort of tax on, on petrol. Mm. on diesel that kind of thing paraffin maybe as well mm. government in any way that they can put a tax on you they're going to try so yeah. they're going to try and fit this in any way and we're going to carry that burden so don't just think you know listeners in terms of filling out your SARS your tax return that's the, all the tax you're paying you're paying taxes in other ways as well yeah. um, businesses in general have to defer those tax costs onto us the consumers mm -hmm. they can't just wish them away kind of thing yeah. end of the day they have to find the space for them somewhere yeah. ways of doing that is either raising prices of goods and services or laying off uh, workers which adds yeah. to the unemployment figure which we know now the expanded figure is 38 percent unemployed yeah. which is ridiculous um so yeah just that's one big example of a new tax coming i'm sure there'll be another tax shortfall at some point announced and then they'll announce higher income taxes that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, understand for many people they see it as morally you know good they want to pay their taxes they like to think that it's being used for some sort of welfare help for those people in society who can't help themselves kind of thing but then you should at least very very strongly hold government to account for how they use those taxes yeah. so ask for transparency push for clarity of what they're doing it for for example not on a hundred million rand for the inauguration <laughs> of the president that yeah. sort of thing um hold them to account we know that the mps get a lot uh, for their cars i think they can have two cars yeah. to the combined value of 1.9 million yes yeah. yeah that kind of thing um so yeah i, th I just think we need to be a lot more strict in <laughs> what we expect of the politicians and what they do with our taxes uh, in reality you know they think it's really it's sort of okay well what you have seen this idea that you have to be happy about paying tax because it's it's helping poor people. What what the most one of the most I find personally I think it's one of the most idiotic ideas that people have. I mean, if you want to be happy about doing something, you you, you give your money to charity, you do something for poor people yourself. Mm. It's not that you someone comes points a gun at you, takes your money away, and then comes and spends it on your behalf. I don't know why how quite how that works. How mm. what kind of what kind of society are we that we sort of expect people to be happy about uh, being robbed? Mm. I mean, it, it, you can make the argument for taxes. I'm sure that there are people who can make the argument for taxes that some things are just too crucial mm. to leave to uh, voluntary people's voluntary. Just, okay, I accepted that. But I, I making the argument for taxes in terms of welfare just seems to be... 
it doesn't make sense to me it doesn't no. it, it doesn't seem to make sense and it's uh, this idea that, and also my other my other issue is with distributive taxation mm. the idea that you can only tax these those people over there that when you tax those specific people over there it's sort of like when you say that you can tax foreigners but you, you won't tax your domestic mm-hmm. people right. so it's, it's the same concept whenever you tax anyone you tax everyone yeah. yeah because they they they, they the ripple effects go throughout the entire mm-hmm. economy mm-hmm. you can't you, there's no way to levy a tax that just targets the rich whenever you target the rich you target the poor if you yeah. target the poor you target the rich it's just then that's how the economy works everyone is reliant on each mm-hmm. other yeah I, I think that's a that's a very important point and, I, and something that i keep realizing more and more is that you are not going to punish a rich, a rich person with taxes. Mm. They mm. have armies of lawyers and accountants mm. and all, and tax advisors, whatever, who know how to structure their affairs in such a way that they pay the least taxes out of everyone. You're, when you levy any tax, that rich person is going to be like, okay, so this is what the government wants from me more. So I'm going to set my prices up, but to that same extent. And for as long as they think that South Africans will still are will still be willing to pay that price for that good. And if we're talking about food and uh, petrol, of course, uh, mm. or, or any cars, people need cars. They will put up their prices. They know we're going to pay it anyway, and they won't pay that the the money for that taxes out of their pockets. So um, to think that. As you point out in Piyaki with this idea of redistribution, uh, re- redistributive justice that is uh, uh, manifested through the uh, these progressive taxes like income tax, um, the the idea that you're you're taking from the rich and giving to the poor is nonsense. You're taking from the poor and give and in in an ideal society you're giving that to the poor again but what in fact is happening is substantial amounts of that is being uh, going to overheads going to st- uh, civil servants who are very uh geez i, I don't want to be insulting here now but a bit but are, slightly are. lackluster <laughs> in in, uh, in how they approach their you jobs just say they're like, 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 like a desert, right? yeah they're lack, <laughs> lackadaisical yeah like lackadaisical whites yeah uh lackadaisical <laughs> civil servants um yeah it uh we're paying we're paying a, 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 a state bureaucracy that is too big and 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 we we do it thinking that we're paying for social services and mm. for welfare when in fact we're paying for the department of sport the national planning commission nkandla uh bloody the new presidential jumbo jumbo jet <laughs> all this nonsense and i mean even even welfare can be done better in the in in a, in a free yeah. market so mm. it's it, all these arguments are, are basically just just stupid and and the the, I, the point i wanted to make about uh this thing about people who say they're happy to pay taxes like bill gates and jeff bezos i think also at some stage said oh we're we're, we're so glad that taxes are being raised because we want to pay more <laughs> if you want to pay more write a check exactly. it's so simple yeah. you write to the government of the republic of south africa 10 million rand they'll happily yeah. take your check do not impose your vision of how much you should be paying on the rest of us yeah, for really. crying out loud uh, we are overtaxed we are way over the uh, the laffer curve Meaning that the more government uh, tries to tax us, the less government money mm. will, uh, the less money government will get, because at this stage, South Africans are like, no, get my money out of this country. We're leaving. Minimize my tax burden. So I wanted to ask, uh, uh, sort of, uh, lay, uh, since you mentioned the lever curve, I wanted to lay a challenge on the on the listeners that uh, if anyone can comment when the last forecast. That, that that had to up, be upgraded upwards in terms of the taxes that were expected to be collected either, either by states SA or SARS. So if you someone can tell me the last month or the last time or the last date that government actually came out and say, oh sorry, we were wrong. We thought we were going to raise this much in taxes, but we ended up getting more in taxes than what we expected. <laughs> if anyone can tell me that the, when when that last happened. Yeah, no, that doesn't happen. I, and I think you mentioned yeah. this to me in Piaki that we've been experiencing tax shortfalls for yeah. several years yeah. in a row now. Yeah. Uh, you you just mentioned like a number of 60 billion accumulative every year is is what, what we're missing out. I, never so really I, know I, think, I think between the now, the expectations between now, between October last year, and now just recently when they released the last the last estimate it was a, the, a shortfall cumulatively it was a shortfall of something like 60 billion mm. so now they they only report on the latest 
estimate. So they tell you. Mm. So when they report, you'll get like, oh, it's only a 14 billion rand mm. estimate. But then if you look at, the, at their previous mm. estimates, you see, okay, it's actually in total, it's, yeah. it's some huge number. Mm. I'm sure if you go back even further, go to last year, January, it will actually keep increasing because if you look, if you keep looking at the docs that they've been releasing, they've been consistently missing their targets. It will be interesting now because the sort of fault guy for this was Tom Moyane because he was running SAR so bad. <laughs> it will be interesting there to see how with this new sort of competent new guy who is mm. in there, if they will actually meet their targets. Yeah. I my bet will be no because yeah. they I think it's the economics rather than the person yeah. who's running SARS. Yeah, I mean geez, uh, so it's a sixty billion rand short for so this means this is the difference. There's a sixty billion rand difference between what the government needs for its current budget, its current spending targets, and what it actually has. And then on top of that, NHI, National Health Insurance, which has not been implemented yet, I think last I checked was projected to cost like 400 billion rand. Something like a year, not like in total. Something like a year or, or like over three years, 400 billion. When, that when, puts like ESCOM to shame. Yes, I mean, ESCOM just <laughs> hit... you guys it, think about how bad ESCOM is. Yeah, I think ESCOM's dead just hit 500 billion. <laughs> the, the, and when we say like... NHI is simply unaffordable. It's not hyperbole. We're not. We're not just saying, yeah, no, it's expensive. It's like we cannot pay for it. It's yeah. a simple. The money doesn't exist. They will need to cut existing welfare yeah. at least in half. Just take away social grants mm. if they want to pay for NHI. But no, they're going to implement NHI, destroy the private sector, and then none of us are going to have healthcare anyway. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, on that somber note. <laughs> At least be happy that tomorrow is Tax Freedom Day. <laughs> you can now uh, go to work holding your head high, knowing that the money you're getting in is actually yours. It's not that it's not marked for SARS. Uh, and yeah, be happy and, and please start pushing for lower taxes. Too few people are saying that we are overtaxed. You may think that most people are, are radically anti-tax, but it's, it's not being said as much as it yeah. should be. So please uh, make that point. Just on that point of people yeah. telling people to hold their heads high and what you mentioned with some of the <clears throat> billionaires who are supposed who call for higher taxes, that's the broader point that they see it as bad as earning a lot of money, right? Yes. And the government as well. So taxes are, a, it's a punishment in a way, whereas they should be rewarding people for being productive. Yeah. So just keep that in mind as well, you know, you yeah. making money is a moral endeavor. Yeah. Don't like, don't think less of yourself because you've made a success of yourself. Yeah, do not, so. do not feel guilty for success and not just not just because other people are failing no, just because there's a lot of poverty in south africa does not mean you are guilty mm. for being successful there is a lot of failure in south africa because we punish yeah. success yeah. so when we stop feeling guilty about success when we stop punishing success then poverty i'm i'm almost certain of it will start declining rapidly yeah. but yeah so uh thank you listeners for listening to another episode of the free marketeers Please uh, remember to subscribe to this YouTube channel if you're not already. That is the big red button under this video. Um, follow us on Twitter. It is at FMF South Africa. And uh, like us on Facebook. It is FMFSA in the URL or Free Market Foundation South Africa. And always visit our website www.freemarketfoundation.com. Thanks for listening. Cheers.